Okay, uh, thank you very much. I am very delighted to be here and grateful to the organizers for having the opportunity to speak. I hope I will not keep you uh, too long, but there are some uh, points that I think fit in very well with the discussion that we have just heard about uh, transmission of mathematics. I'd like to move us to the, um, or continue in the uh, subfield of mathematics uh, known as mathematical astronomy, and um, in particular, talking about some of the developments, the varieties of cosmological theories that uh, we see in Sanskrit texts, particularly in the early modern period and moving into uh, modern works. Now, um, it is uh, a uh, truism, it's very well known, that the uh, majority of pre-modern astronomy involved a cosmology that was uh, geocentric and geostable. If um, the, where the Earth was uh, considered to be a sphere for the purposes of scientific theories, it was taken to be at the center of the Earth and um, non-rotating. This is the case for pretty much everywhere in uh, classical astronomy where this model uh, prevailed. Um, this, of course, as we have just heard from Professor de Vacheren, was not um, universally held. In particular, Aryabhata challenges this idea with the um, uh, quite correct notion of a uh, rotating Earth. This um, was not a, um, an accepted idea in medieval astronomy in the classical uh, uh, Siddhantic Jyotisha tradition or elsewhere in the medieval period. Uh, what we uh, know in somewhat later times, thanks to the work of some uh, people here present, is the uh, modification of the um, geocentric model by, uh, in the work of the Kerala School or Nila School, associated specifically with Nila Kanta, um, to uh, devise what, you know, in modern terms we might call a, a quasi tyconic model, although, of course, uh, Tycho Brahe, with whom this is associated, was later than Nila Kanta. That is, the uh, inferior planets, Mercury and Venus, orbit the sun, whereas the um, Earth is still considered to be uh, the center of the sun's orbit. And we also have, in um, many parts of the Sanskrit tradition, records of encounters with um, early modern European heliocentrism in various forms, you know, all uh, areas of um, Sanskrit mathematical astronomy are unfortunately understudied. This is perhaps one of the most understudied of them. So we're going to um, try to redress that a little bit in the uh, short time today by looking at a particular manuscript that um, I encountered by accident. I am not the first person to have mentioned this manuscript, but it was new to me when I came across it working at Berlin a few years ago, and I'm looking for um, manuscripts relating to astronomy in the Staatsbibliothek or uh, National Library there. One of the manuscripts that I thought might be useful to a um, study of Sanskrit astronomical tables that I'm currently completing with my colleague Clemency Montel uh, was one called the uh, Surya Grahana Kartavyata, the performance of or computation of the solar eclipse. And uh, what this turned out to be, in fact, was something you know, not unrelated to that, but um, on a, with a much um, broader scope and a very specific, interesting application to the history of mathematical astronomy. So what it relates to, suddenly switching back from Sanskrit to Latin, is um, this work that was published first in 1702 and subsequently in the 1727 edition, a um, set of uh, astronomical tables along with um, theory and instructions for using them by a French astronomer called Philippe de la Hire. And um, one of the 
resemblances, we note, in the Berlin Sanskrit manuscript is in these diagrams. Here is a diagram by Lahir on, um, involving the solar detonation. Here, as you can see, is a hand-drawn equivalent of that in the Sanskrit version with the sphere and the um, letter labels la and la for L and L and ba here and na here and the uh, a for a over there. So um, this is just one of the signs that uh, indicated that this was something for a, um, a classical Siddhantic Jyotisha manuscript rather unusual and connected it to this Latin text. So, and uh, what we're going to do henceforth is focus mostly on the manuscript because uh, for one thing, it's a great pleasure to me to be able to uh, give a talk on Indian mathematics to an audience, you know, most of which can be assumed to be able to read Nagari. And another is that I find that in almost any language or tradition in history of science that you talk about, what people are most reluctant to do or most um, you know, intimidated by is the study of actual manuscripts, the original texts. And I would like um, you know, more uh, students in particular to um, start uh, digging around in Sanskrit manuscripts that they may find in family libraries or anywhere else and starting to read them. So we uh, might as well start our practice here. Um, backing up to a bit of the context of the um, school of Jai Singh in early 18th century Jaipur. Uh, he is the Maharaja of Amber under the um, Mughal Emperor Muhammad Shah and reigned for about the first half of the 18th century. And um, he was one of the many early modern um, Indian rulers who were uh, uh, profoundly interested in astronomy, the astral sciences and um, mathematics in general, and the pragmatic aspects of reconciling calendars and the observances of people of different faiths in their, among their subjects. So he collected a number of um, both Hindu, Muslim, and um, Christian Jesuit astronomers working at his observatories. He built a number of uh, large masonry observatories, the famous Junter Munter instruments, and um, the uh, perhaps most um, you know, major or uh, the capstone output of their collaboration was a um, actually a classic Islamic calendrical astronomical work, the Zij Muhammad Shah, the um, Zij or Islamic astronomical tables written for the uh, current emperor Muhammad Shah. So this is thought to have been completed sometime in the late uh, 1730s, and as we'll see, that may have a bearing on the text that we talk about. Now, um, one of the books that the Jesuit astronomers brought to Jai Singh's court was the 1727 edition of Lahir's Tabulae Astronomicae, or Astronomical Tables in Latin. Uh, in about uh, 1730, this uh, work seems to have come to the court, and a number of um, Sanskrit works were written from uh, about or you know, regarding it. And these were discussed by the late David Pingree uh, as recently as 2002, but um, the study of them has somewhat stagnated since then. And much of the material in this particular work is, um, it has not been addressed at all. But the uh, works that we do know something about, the so-called Paksha Sarani um, by Jaya Simha's astronomer Kevalarama, early 1730s. Another work um, less um, clearly classified or um, identified, the so-called Sanskrit uh, prose version around 1734, which um, does not discuss eclipses. Let's uh, recall that the um, manuscript from Berlin that we're talking about actually is, um, was 
named or nicknamed the uh, Surya Grahana Kartavyata, so eclipses are an important part of it. And then there was a named treatise in prose, the Firangi Chandra Chedyopa Yogaka, about the uh, European or Firangi lunar models, which is dated to the middle of the 1730s. So um, some background information concerning Sanskrit study or Sanskrit recensions of De La Hire's Latin work um, is known, but we'll move from here to the details of the Berlin manuscript. And here is a little snippet of it taken from the um, colophon. As you see, we can um, quite confidently associate it with the Jaipur school because um, there is this reference to Savai Jaipuri, uh, Jaipuri, Surya Grahanam Kriyate, here is the um, Sambat and Shaka date. Um, an unusual date formulation here, as you see, uh, Vaishaka Krishna 30 Chandre. Um, of course, Krishna Paksha, like you know, uh, both mon monthly Pakshas, runs from 1 to 15, not to 30. But um, we do see that um, there, this does historically seem to coincide with the solar eclipse of Monday, 3 May 1734, which um, in fact uh, is equivalent to uh, Chaitra Krishna Paksha 15 of uh, Shaka 1656, if the months are counted from full moon, Purnamanta. And it is known that this particular uh, eclipse was observed at Delhi by um, one of Jai Singh's Jesuit astronomers, Father uh, Charles Boudier. So um, if somehow we can reconcile this date with um, this uh, formulation of it in the colophon, we can be fairly confident that this is the eclipse discussed here. So backing up a bit to look at the structure of the text, the first thing to note is that there are actually two copies or two partial copies of it in the same manuscript. I've shown you here the very beginning of the text and um, in the first page and then after um, four folios, the text um, starts all over again with exactly the same terms. So um, there is one you know, abbreviated form of the text and um, then a more uh, prolonged version, which itself may not be totally complete. And that is you know, just a, um, seems like a bibliographic, fairly trivial bibliographic feature. But what's interesting about it is that this um, kind of aggregation of copies of the same work is something that we have seen in other Sanskrit translations of this uh, Jai Singh school. There is um, the, exactly the same phenomenon with a manuscript that I've been working on with a uh, translation of um, Islamic trigonom trigonometry as well. So um, for some reason, this seems to have been you know, a practice in their library that um, uh, different partial copies of the same work could be just collated into the same manuscript and then wherever those manuscripts ended up, you know, remaining in the Jaipur library, finding their way to Berlin, you know, elsewhere, whatever, they would be um, multiple manuscripts. And what this tells us is that we don't have here merely a single handwritten copy of somebody's notes or draft for a particular um, uh, effort at creating a work, but an actual work that was at least partially copied and um, you know, repeated verbatim in um, multiple exemplars. So um, there are many other things that we could uh, say about just the first few sentences of this manuscript, but let's move on a bit here. But uh, with, not without looking at one interesting um, trace of this uh, synthesis approach of the um, uh, Sanskritized version based on a uh, Latin treatise. As you see 
in both cases, the, um, in both uh, copies, the text starts out with the usual auspicious invocation or the form of it with uh, Sri Ganesho Vijayate Taran, right? And um, this is followed by what appears to be a Sanskritization of a Christian benediction from, that was derived from one of the um, Jesuit uh, astronomers, this uh, Isho Jayati. So I would very much like to know the history of the um, you know, assimilation of these two invocatory phrases, you know, how that worked out in the translation process. But we'll come back to that. But before we do, let's just um, take a look at some of the connections between this manuscript and um, the known relations of the Sanskrit astronomy and De La Hire's Latin astronomy. So here is one of the um, uh, closest connections that we know in this manuscript to um, other Sanskritizations of this work. Over on the left, we have a diagram of the orbit of Mars in particular, or any superior planet, by De La Hire in the Tabulae Astronomicae. Here is, in the center, a very close uh, copy or you know, reproduction of that in Sanskrit from this other Sanskrit version of the text, the Farangi Chandra, and here is the version of that that we see in the um, Berlin manuscript, where we've got um, the same zodiac set up with Karka and uh, Makara, or Cancer and Capricorn, and um, Aries and Libra, Nation Tula, and but the um, position of the uh, planet and the um, uh, apogees of the orbits has been switched around. So clearly what we've got here in this new manuscript or uh, the most recently uh, examined one is not just a copy of a previously known work, but something that somebody has modified to try to understand it in a different way. And uh, we uh, introduced this as a discussion of you know, heliocentrism in Sanskrit. So um, we should back up from that a bit to say just a, a few words about heliocentrism in the Latin. As um, you may be aware, um, at this time, the early 18th century, the uh, Catholic Church and the um, Jesuit uh, order were not fully on board with the idea of heliocentrism. There were uh, concerns about um, you know, uh, contradictions of um, sacred scripture in the Bible, and there was the, um, the whole incident with Galileo in the previous century that you will doubtless have heard of. So um, it was still you know, presenting um, the solar system as centered on the sun, was um, still rather a delicate subject for European scientists in certain contexts at this time, and um, an instrumentalist approach was often favored. That the people would say, you know, they're not um, making any definitive statements about what the universe is really like, but if we you know, treat a geometric model this way for the purpose of doing calculations, we find that the calculations work. So. We see an example of that here in the um, diagram for this superior planet orbit, where um, not at the center, but slightly eccentric, we have S for the sun and the little sun um, figure there. And quite clearly going around the sun is the circular orbit of T for Terra, or Earth, and um, P, a planet. 
moving on its own orbit. And the um, Sanskrit version, as we said, in a uh, rather modified way, has rethought this, but um, represented it in the same way. Su for Surya, the sun, more or less in the middle, and again, a similar sort of um, uh, symbol with uh, the rays coming out of it. Ta for the T standing for Terra, and Pa for the P of Planetum, or the planet here, and a little note about Bauma, say Mars, which planet it is, in case um, the reader might be confused. So this gives us the um, connection, base connection, between these two uh, texts, and um, it, now let's either move on to some of the details of their discussion. So in the first place, um, it would be useful to have an idea of the mechanics of actually creating such a translation. It is, uh, nowadays we think of translation as something that is, tends to be done by one bilingual person who can read a, um, text in the source language and recast it in the destination language and um, it does that individually. We know from uh, records of um, translations at uh, other Indian courts and at uh, Jai Singh's as well that this was not the approach taken to um, translation of scientific works. These were team efforts done by uh, people from, with different linguistic skills and um, with uh, either bilingual themselves or with some language in common with a third party, an interpreter. So as um, S.R. Sarma has uh, written on these court translations, you would have for the translation of an Arabic work, for example, a Muslim astronomer reading out an Arabic text and explaining it in a local dialect of the vernacular, and then a um, Sanskrit uh, pundit who also knew that vernacular would convert those sentences into uh, Sanskrit and write them down. So you would get, um, in uh, many cases, something very far from a literal translation, but something that would have you know, much more meaning for the Sanskrit, uh, Sanskrit literate intended audience. Here, for example, at, um, in Jai Singh's uh, court, uh, Nayanasuka Upadhyaya actually uh, makes a remark about how this uh, was uh, produced. It was explained, Arabi Bashataha from the Arabic language by um, a Abida, that is a Muhammad Abida, whose uh, identity we know from uh, the court records, and it was composed in Sanskrit by Nayanasuka. So that gives us a sense of the basic procedure for um, working with the um, De La Hire treatise uh, via the Latin literate uh, Jesuit astronomers, but it must certainly have been more complicated than this uh, method suggests, and here's one of the reasons we know that. For example, and pardon my Latin, but um, there isn't much we need to know about this. The um, treatise starts, as most uh, uh, pre-modern astronomical treatises do, with the discussion of calendar conversions. You can't know anything about the mathematical astronomy of the planets until you can figure out what day it is in whatever particular calendar you're using. And here, at the beginning of De La Hire's treatise, he discusses the uh, Gregorian and the uh, Julian and Egyptian calendars, the uh, ancient era of Nabonassar that was um, used in some classic uh, Greek astronomical works. But um, these are all the um, calendars that he talks about. He certainly doesn't get into any non-Western uh, calendar descriptions. Whereas the start of the... Um, text at the, um, in the Sanskrit version, as we can see here, starting around here, 
Tatradao Muhammadu Shahi Sananainam. So the beginning is um, the year determination in the siege of Muhammad Shah. And uh, he's mentioning the Hijri year. This is absolutely something, not something that he got from the Latin, and um, almost certainly not something that he got from one of the Jesuit astronomers themselves, who were not conversant with um, uh, Islamic calendars. But this was something that Hindu and Islamic astronomers at Jaising's court in the 1730s had been working on. That is, the siege of Muhammad Shah. So um, we see in the, um, later in the manuscript, in fact, a little table of the weekday numbers for the start of Hijri months in the Islamic calendar. And these are, since we don't have enough classical languages in here, here's a Persian excerpt from the Ziji Muhammad Shah itself, which um, uses exactly the same sort of table to um, provide exactly that information with the, um, alphanumeric uh, numerals of the Arabo-Persian alphabet. So what the, um, this uh, concept uh, or um, procedure for calendar conversions in the Latin treatise, which is dealing um, strictly with um, Christian and classical calendars, has been replaced uh, at the start of the Sanskrit version with a um, discussion of conversion between the uh, Vikrama year or Shaka year and the Hijra year. So something that is of local significance and necessity for dealing with an astronomical text. But we still have the connection present with the Latin source. So we know that this isn't um, simply um, the author of the Sanskrit version, you know, just uh, replacing the or Latin original with uh, material from the Ziji Muhammad Shah, because we have um, in the Latin a reference to the uh, noon versus midnight epoch, where astronomers are um, counting days from successive noons, whereas the um, popular European approach, which is um, still in use today, um, now as part of uh, global timekeeping, is to uh, count days from midnight. And in fact, a little later in this calendric section, the um, Sanskrit author notes that the followers of the Isha Dharma uh, number days from midnight, but the astronomers from noon. So he's working with calendars that are more useful to him in his local context, but he's um, still remaining aware and providing information about the um, material that is relevant from the Latin source. Okay. I think I am going to skip this part that um, is involving the hybridization of Latin and uh, Islamic material in the Sanskrit version. We can come back to that later if there is interest. And I'd like to um, finish up by um, looking at, um, in some detail, at the um, Latin mathematics or aspects of the Latin mathematics that are Sanskritized in what is at this point really an innovative way. So we're um, having the, um, the technical language of Sanskrit mathematical astronomy is, you know, uh, expanding and adapting to represent these concepts that are uh, currently not part of the technical procedures. So here we are you know, tracking somewhat more closely the Latin source, which says, you know, let the um, as the or as the uh, sine of the angle of the sun is to the sine of the angle at the Earth, so is the tangent 
of the um, inclination of the planet that is on its own orbit to the tangent of the latitude. And that's enough uh, Latin for now. That's all we need to um, discuss the um, uh, Sanskrit material, which is saying then the, this word nishpati of the uh, sign of the angle tasara. Where is that coming from? Tatra tasara kona jya, sorry, jaya nishpatihi, with the sign of angle satara is as much as the nishpati of the shadow, the chaya, of the previously determined oblique angle is with the shadow of the angle of latitude. So we end up with the um, chaya of the angle of latitude and thus will be the knowledge of the latitude. Now, um, Sanskrit chaya is a familiar term for um, shadow, and because it's um, trigonometrically equivalent to a um, tangent, that is what um, became the standard uh, term in Arabic and Persian for the tangent, the zil, or shadow. But um, so this word is then um, kept in preference to the uh, Latin uh, word tangent, so there is no um, new technical term coined for that. It's simply the um, same uh, word that is, uh, applies to the trigonometric concept of shadow traditionally. But what is this word nishpati that the um, shadow has? Well, here I think what we are looking at is a reference to the um, types of trigonometric tables that appear in the Latin treatise. Uh, generally, at this period, you, uh, trigonometric tables would not have been tables of the trigonometric functions themselves, but of log trig functions. Probably not many people here have used log trig functions in the uh, past. You had to do that in the days before electronic computation because, of course, log logarithms of trigonometric functions were uh, easier to compute with, where you might um, have to multiply or divide uh, the function values themselves. You could just add or subtract their logarithms. And this was a feature of the trigonometric tables in um, the, uh, the Latin astronomical works, but they would not have been previously familiar to the astronomers, uh, the Indian astronomers at Jai Singh's court. So I think, and I would very much like to have a discussion about the etymology of why a term like nishpati would be used for this purpose, that um, this is a, a term intended to represent this uh, you know, uh, function of a logarithmic function of a trigonometric function. So, well, there we could um, look at our angles, ta, sa, ra, if uh, we wanted to uh, reassure ourselves that they are the same in the Latin and the Sanskrit, but I think that's okay. So, let me um, sum up then by um, describing some uh, features that we think we can associate with this uh, text. That is, um, it seems possible that in addition to the previously known works in Sanskrit from Jai Singh's court that reflect the um, study of this Latin astronomy with um, the Jesuit astronomers, what uh, we may have in this Berlin manuscript is a new and perhaps later and um, you know, more um, ambitious version of some of that. 
For one thing, it includes um, computations of the eclipse, which the um, previously known Sanskrit prose version omitted. And um, it is uh, attempting to synthesize the uh, calendric procedures in Latin with the calendars that are locally more important to its computations and to the, um, the eras and uh, the techniques that um, were uh, set down in the Ziju Muhammad Shah, which is uh, earlier produced at the same court. Unlike some of the earlier uh, Sanskrit um, representations of the Latin astronomy, it seems to successfully distinguish between the concepts of the trig and the log trig functions, and even to have a technical term representing those. And there are some you know, equally ambitious, more complicated diagrams that don't appear in either the other Sanskrit versions or in the Latin version itself. So I think um, that represent the uh, efforts of um, people working you know, either uh, with the Jesuit astronomers or based on the uh, previous explanations by them to attempt to understand how this European astronomy would work for more complicated um, situations such as this. This is the um, most elaborate diagram that I, uh, occurs in the manuscript, and I have not yet figured out all of what it means, but that is definitely something to be worked on. So that's where we stand with that. Thank you. <laughs>